good afternoon and good evening to our distinguished speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. We are back again with yet another session of very educational lectures just for you. The first speaker of today is our honored guest and senior faculty from Guadalajara and Austria, Professor Klaus Dieter Maria Resch. Professor Resch has his medical education from world-renowned neurosurgeons like Professor Yasser Gil and Professor Perneski. He started his work with clinical anatomy and established the surgical simulation concept and training environment. He blossomed and refined endoscopic anatomy for neurosurgery under Professor Perneski and progressed to endoscopic surgical simulation techniques for aneurysms, which later became the basics of endoscopic-assisted microneurosurgery. His meritorious careers include many firsts, including introduction of endoscopic ultrasound into minimally invasive neurosurgery to navigate endoscopes in complex hydrocephalus. He has also developed the intracerebral hematoma evacuation concept and the technique for minimally invasive neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker, and today he is going to talk about his favorite topic, which is minimally invasive neurosurgery concepts and techniques. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from Shanghai, China, Professor Shi Chifang. Professor Chifang is the Associate Professor in the Department of Neurosurgery, Huashan Hospital, Pudan University, Shanghai, China. Dr. Chifang got his Doctor of Medicine degree in Shanghai Medical College, Pudan University, and finished residency training in Huashan Hospital. He also did his fellowship in the Department of Anatomical and Cellular Pathology, the Chinese University of Hong Kong for glioma research. He also finished Global Clinical Scholar Research Training Program in Harvard Medical School. Dr. Chifeng is the Vice Director of the Molecular Laboratory of the Neurosurgical Institute of Pudan University and General Secretary of the Neuro-Oncology Committee of the Shanghai Anti-Cancer Association and also a committee member of the Society of Neuro-Oncology of China. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker and he's going to talk about molecular pathology in the diagnosis and management of gliomas. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from Shanghai, China, again, Professor Shubin, who is our main mentor from China, and he has been helping us ever since we started broadcasting our webinars. Professor Shubin holds the largest series of Moyama disease in the world, and we are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair today's webinar at a very short notice. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our distinguished senior, senior faculty from Japan, Professor Yoshitaka Narita. Professor Narita is the professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery and Neuro-Oncology at the National Cancer Center Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. He is the co-chair, Neuro-Oncology Education Committee, WFNS, and the director of Japan Society of Neuro-Oncology and Japan Neurosurgical Society. He also serves as the head of Committee of Brain Tumor Registry of Japan and Committee on Guidelines, as well as director of Japan Society of Intraoperative Imaging and Japan Awake Surgery Association. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of Professor Shi Chifeng. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kata, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and all the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to our very honorable Professor Shubin. Dear Raja, and the first speaker is uh, Professor Klaus Rasch uh, from Germany. Actually, uh, he followed the uh, Professor Paneski and the Actually, in our uh, hospital, we also have a minimum, uh, minimally invasive team. It's also uh, learned from Professor Paneski. So let's give the time to Professor Klaus. I'm very honored to be with you today. And uh, I welcome uh, all the audience, but also the colleagues. And I thank very much uh, Professor Kato and Professor Raya, that they did all this work that we can go come together even in these times. Uh, the, the, the talk is about the key concept in MIN and key techniques and training in MIN. I will go to different uh, points uh, of this topic and uh, Let's start with Professor Panetsky shortly. Some, some, just some, uh, some spotlights of pro my great and main teacher, Professor Panetsky. Um, <clears throat> you all know he was a, a visionary and a inventor, but also a passionate teacher, uh, ha having uh, founded many formats of teaching and courses and invented many instruments. And the last one was this, uh, this robot arm with endoscope or without endoscope, so-called exoscope, which are becoming now everywhere available. 
but also he was uh, an author and editor, you know his major contributions, I don't have to go into details, I guess. This is the program I want to go with you, the recent roots of minimal invasive neurosurgery, Yasha and Panetsky. But then I will go on further on with evolution of the keyhole concept. Then I will give an example by minimal invasive ICH evacuation, some few cases, and then I will talk about the min key techniques. Uh, I will outline only the sonography because this, this is the min technique mostly uh, not known by many colleagues. Then I'll go on to the very important thematic of ergonomics for MIN, because this is the red line for the future, ergonomics for MIN. And coming from there to the training conditions and to the conclusions. Well, in the, in the evolution, uh, <clears throat> I will talk uh, now about uh, the two roots uh, of MIN, of modern minimal invasive neurosurgery, which is Professor uh, Jaschakil and Panetsky. Here you see uh, Mozart and Beethoven of minimal invasive neurosurgery, uh, the founders. And uh, for me, it was always interesting. What is their secret of excellence? Because I know both of them. I was pupil of both and uh, they are so different personally. So I could not believe that they should have the same quality, but there is a secret which they have common, which they are common, and this must uh, have to be found out by me as a pupil. But of course, everybody must find his own way. This is now the so-called, as I call it, the ergonomics concept and setting of Yashar Gil the nowadays gold standard of micro neurosurgery. There are many components, not only the microscope, but only new concepts, magnification, mouth tracking, very important mouth tracking has, was not successful everywhere in the world, but is very important. New instrument families and new preparation technique, the so-called subarachnoid pathway which is the, the pathway of micro neurosurgery, but gravitation management also very important. Of course, Yashikil introduced and founded many new concepts, new approaches, subarachnoidal approach, as I have mentioned, new instruments, but also new anatomical concepts, seven lobe concept, and uh, of course the contrabass system. Now look, this is the change from Panetsky, from Yashakil to Panetsky. Completely different working conditions. The keyhole is a concept. It's not a bull hole, it's a concept. And the ergonomics uh, of uh, uh, Panetsky is that this hole uh, is uh, uh, only a concept and that endoscopy uh, has to assist microneurosurgery. So she, he combined endoscopy and microneurosurgery to endoscopy assisted microneurosurgery. He has an exoscope, uh, a robotic arm and head mounted display. Uh, of course, also new concepts, uh, needle instruments, new family of instruments, and of course, a complete different preparation concept because he's a more coaxial uh, preparation technique through small gaps and small uh, approach canals. And again, gravitation management is important. Also in the Panetsky concept, many new concepts uh, are founded and uh, very important is that planning becomes a major rule. Uh, so you don't go into OR and you open and you look what you can do. This is uh, not actually uh, correct. In the Panetsky concept, you have a thorough planning and you know exactly uh, which of the small approach uh, will be the, that one that gives you the best access to the lesion. So uh, 
each, uh, each standard approach is a sum of minimal invasive approaches and you have to analyze by the imaging and the clinical material which of these approaches is, will be the best one. So again, the main contribution of the Panetsky School was the combination of endoscopy and microsurgery, to endoscopy-assisted microsurgery. The techniques are combined to compensate the disadvantages of each technique. The microscope can be replaced in many cases only to work endoscopy-assisted. Paraendoscopic preparation technique not through the endoscope, not transendoscopically, but paraendoscopically. And standard approaches became individual approaches. This, this caused, this led to an increased application spectrum in, for endoscopy, which we have not known before. And the keyhole is now intracranial, very important, not extracranial. And the keyhole is at the tip of the endoscope, uh, which causes a lot of safety problems. Not all of them are solved. So we have to go a, a, a step forward, because uh, in the beginning of minimal invasive concept by Panetsky, uh, the approach and the, the uh, possibility to do it uh, was concentrated of the analysis of the approach. But um, this caused a lot of misunderstandings because we had most time, 20 years long, a so-called whole discussion. But the, the whole is, is a consequence of planning, not the goal of minimal invasive surgery. So it, uh, I advanced the keyhole concept to that what I call the min key concept. In this concept, we do not ask for the whole. We ask for the key. Which is the key for minimal invasive neurosurgery? Conceptual key and technical keys. We ask for the key. The most unknown key is ergonomics. I will come to this point later. So the the, the uh, keyhole is not the goal of minimal invasive neurosurgery. It is a result of planning. Once you do a extremely precise planning and analysis of the imaging and the clinical data, you will come to a smaller approach, a preciser approach. But the problem of this time, which also led to misunderstandings, is that the, the reason why we do this kind of surgery cannot be founded on anatomy and keyhole. It is a pathophysiological concept. It is a traumatological co concept because the justification of MIN and all efforts of MIN comes from pathophysiology because we want to minimize the overall trauma. And this is a pathophysiological principle. Well, this has been founded in very difficult lesions. So we, we got something like a, a VIP minimal invasive uh, neurosurgery. Only the masters could approach this kind of, of technique uh, uh, and so it was difficult to spread and to educate the next generation uh, with this technique. And we have to think about this because the younger generation should be taught about minimal invasive techniques and principles early. And therefore, for example, the lesion of, of uh, ICH can be very well used because many cases of ICH evacuations are not so difficult so that the next gener generation and the youngest, the assistants can start with ICH evacuation. It's a very large uh, 
uh, lesion uh, group, a very large amount of patients, 4 million worldwide a year. So there are many cases, many, many cases that could improve by min. So we have finally two kinds of worlds in minimal invasive evacuation of, uh, of ICH. Uh, the classical concept actually in Europe is craniectomy concept. Evacuation is not usual since the stitch study. So we have got, we got two kinds of worlds, the, the craniectomy world and the minimal invasive, the min world, the min concept world. Uh, but in the results, in all cases, in, with the minimal invasive technique, we saw much better cause of recovery than in craniectomy cases. The patients were not disabled by additional stigmata like craniectomy defect, big scarves, loss of the hair and psychological trauma. These are very important things uh, for the recovery. And uh, this is uh, an example uh, Ganglia, uh, lateral ganglia hematoma uh, close to major vessels. Where, therefore, I had to uh, control it intraoperatively by ultrasound. I, I saw there is some tissue between the bleeding and between the vessels, which was not so clear in the, in the CTA, but in the ultrasound, sagittal and coronal, it was quite clear the bifurcation of the carotid artery intracranial uh, was not in contact with the bleeding. So I could go ahead with the technique and the patient surprised me two months later by this video where she was skiing after, after stroke. So this is a, a case of a, a central region uh, hematoma and uh, by thrombo as medication and he was also he had a hemi he was hemiplegic on the right side and it was evacuated only through a bull hole and this is pre and this is post op and he surprised me two hours later when i visited him post op with a with a perfect moving of of the right side with full with full power this is another case is an old lady and she experienced a bleeding a subfrontal and infrafrontal causing a neuropsychological problem so what we do here is not to evacuate because the patient is in a very bad condition but we make functional neurosurgery we preserve the function and this is very important we have not many time to do this because the, the destruction by the blood products start some hours post onset so there is a, a also additional there is a software problem in the brain because the, the brain will recover as faster the earlier the training can begin and this is not the case in standard evacuation. And you will see that, that uh, in such cases, uh, the blood has the pressure of the blood causes that many hematomas evacuate themselves just by the, by the pressure. You don't have to open too much, it will come out. And all the cases have been done only microsurgically, through small approaches or through bull holes. I come to that later how this can work so this is the classical cause of such an operation approaching evacuation but then you have to do before opening the dura and after the first evacuation you must do an ultrasound you cannot do this kind of surgery with such bleedings and such approaches without ultrasound is impossible i would not do this by myself and I will do not recommend it. You need to be familiar with intraoperative ultrasound. I will come to this point later. After evacuation, again ultrasound control 
and closing by sealing technique. Suturing is mostly in this uh, in these small approaches uh, very difficult, if impossible. So, clo uh, sealing technique is one of the key techniques of of uh, minimal invasive concept. And so you see, we have two worlds. We have the world of craniectomy. This is what we know in Europe in all departments actually due to the results of the stitch study, whatever it means. Stitch study has a lot of, of uh, scientific problems. And this is the world of minimal invasive evacuation of hematomas. Now I come, so the hematoma evacuation is an excellent, excellent uh, lesion for, for the, for the uh, residents to start early minimal invasive neurosurgery but they have to learn the key techniques. In my concept, there are five key techniques. One is mouth tracked high zoom microsurgery. The other is uh, endoscopy, neuroendoscopy, and neurosonography, but also laser and especially important sealing technique. In many cases, you cannot really close uh, tightly. So you have to seal. Sealing is to prevent complications. So I, I go now, uh, I come now to one of the key techniques and I, I have chosen only the ultrasound from the five key techniques because it's the most, uh, it's the technique that is most not known by many colleagues. Uh, ultrasound is uh, a technique uh, in, in neurosurgery, you must have a high-end machine. It's very important because you have a lot of information preoperatively. If you want to have important additional intraoperative information, you need a high-end technique. I use only very small probes because it makes no sense to make a big approach only for the ultrasound. So poor hole approach is the most used approach in my uh, technique. By the way, here you see the transendoscopic ultrasound technique, how it works. I cannot go into details in this technique, but you see again here the, the ultrasound with the sinus and the bridging veins. So you see ultrasound is, uh, ultrasound is a real time technique the imaging is moving and very important you see the physiology and the pathophysiology in the anatomy not only the images not only the anatomical images as it becomes usual and modern you see pathophysiology also pathophysiology is very important anatomy tells you how you will do the operation pathophysiology tells you which kind of operation, when you should do it and how you should do it also with, with which kind of technique. So what is the indication of neurosonography in my opinion? It's very easy in every cranial procedure because uh, my question is what is behind the dura? And I have learned from Yasha Gil that before opening the dura I should know the character of the lesion. And this is not be, be done by imaging. By just imaging, you will not know the character of the lesion. You have to have some pathophysiological uh, data also. So I could stop my talk about ultrasound here because it's a very easy message. But of course I have to go on because it is not so easy to, to do it in the daily life. However, the brain is an excellent ultrasound organ. It is in a, in a hard uh, cover, but there are some windows you even can transcranially uh, sound and get good images. But sometimes there are remnants of, of craniotomies and bull holes, and you can sound through these remnants also getting very good, uh, very good images. Of course, it is very important that you know how to, 
to deal with the ultrasound. It makes not sense, it makes no sense to take the ultrasound probe, by the way, mostly a big one in such cases and departments, uh, to see a lesion that you have seen already before in the excellent imaging. So you have to make the ultrasound a special instrument to get more important information. And this means you have to know the orientation of the scan you are doing. You have to get familiar, familiar with the orientation. If you do this, you have an excellent intraoperative, intraoperative real-time imaging. Intraoperative real-time imaging. This is what the, uh, all the other preoperative images do not have. By that, if you know the orientation, you will have a navigation system. And with the navigation system, you can navigate, but you can also target. And if the images are of good quality in the high, in the high end technique, you can make you can make a decision making. Sometimes you have to say change the de decision. You can and you must change sometimes the decision before opening the dura because you see something which you have not seen before. To make a, a useful instrument out of the ultrasound, you have to have a system of standard slides, slices of standard slices like the subcortical slice, supraventricular slice, ventricular slice, thal thalamus level, hypothalamus level, and uh, midbrain level. This is important to have such a system. However, during ultrasound, you will play around the tissue, play through the tissue, run and travel through the tissue. So you are always moving your probe and you get a, a lively image that is moving by itself because you have the pathophysiology inside the image. These are the slices you get in a good quality, but uh, you must train this and you can also see the vessels by Sonor CTA. And um, if, you, if you are familiar with this technique, you can get images that can, that can compete with CT and even with MR in some respects. By the way, very important, it is uh, uh, the ultrasound technique has a very good ergonomic quality. That means, in contrast to many imaging, modern intraoperative imaging techniques with huge machines, which disturb the procedure of the surgery, ultrasound is fitting excellently into microsurgical procedures. So you will not be disturbed by this technique. The best way to learn this technique is that you uh, train it, it at the IQ, at bedside examination setting. But if you do so, you should orientate yourself and your position at the bedside as if you would do an intraoperative ultrasound. Then you have an excellent training later for the intraoperative ultrasound. If you do this kind of orientation and bedside setting it at the IQ. So the orientation of the surgeon and the head of the patient and the image of the monitor must be synchronized and converged to a one orientation then you can use it as a navigation system at bedside and you have the best training for intraoperative use. So what I wanted to, to uh, the go home message for you should be ultrasound is a, is a future of neurosurgery, especially of minimal invasive neurosurgery. And you have many other applications that will more and more come up uh, in future and without, I would draw the comment, without ultrasound, neuroendoscopy will not have a progress in the future. 
neuroendoscopy will not have a future without ultrasound. So ultrasound is the imaging. It's your private neuroradiologist beside you intraoperatively and perioperatively also. So I come now to the next point, which is a, a rather new point and difficult point, a little bit seem to be a little bit theoretical, but it contains and shows problems everybody of you and me knows in the daily work. It is the ergonomics, ergonomics in neurosurgery. And ergonomics is decisive important if minimal invasive neurosurgery will, will have a progress. So what does it mean? We all know the chaos, the chaos in the OR. Daily fight with bad conditions, bad chair, noise all around, bad light conditions, bad workflow, emotional irritations, and all the machines and instruments and imaging uh, monsters uh, that disturbs the procedure of, of uh, uh, surgery. And um, without solving the ergonomic problem disaster which we face nowadays in daily life, we will not have a future in MIN. So this is an ergonomic trauma, for example, to the surgeon. I don't go into details, you know all these many monitors, many machines. You cannot uh, concentrate on the patient and on the needs for the patient and for the brain of the patient because you have to fulfill all the, the needs of the machines. This is a ergonomic trauma to the patient. Interruption of the operation, transportation, and do just for doing a, a stupid image. Uh, this can be done by ultrasound excellently. And this is uh, the workflow that I have, uh, that I would recommend to train in the lab, which I have done for, for many years. So it is the classical microsurgical training the monitor video surgical training and the head mount display surgical training. This is the best ergonomic solution. And uh, since 1980, I made this kind of simulation model to train the different kinds of working and the workflow. So anatomical preparation, approach analysis, this approach design, Postmortal inspection in, in pathological cases, of course, is also possible, and paraendoscopic operation simulation, which is should not be learned in the OR, in, in the OR, it should be trained in the laboratory. The transnasal uh, approach was, I guess, the first and best elaborated MIN approach in neurosurgery. This is the clinical uh, way we do now the endoscopy assisted uh, uh, transnasal uh, surgery but everybody knows who is doing this there are still many technical and ergonomic handicaps that are not solved and in cases this can be very dangerous so we have to have a evolution of training all the different types of technique and all the different types of imaging machines and, and instruments need a, a new kind of working flow and this workflow must be trained. So uh, we have a laboratory and uh, we use uh, non-fixed non specimens or if we don't have one we use these plastinated craniums with uh, neurosurgical approaches to do the imaging training. This is a, a, two, a 3D uh, endoscopy with head mounted display, which gives the best impression uh, for, uh, uh, for the, the endoscopy uh, uh, imaging. So in, in uh, coming to the conclusion, uh, we can conclude that there are three fields 
of ergonomics. Uh, one is the uh, paradigm one, the spatial ergonomics. It is derived from the so-called gestalt theory. That means the operation environment is formed and has a structure, a meaningful structure of virtual emergent areas. Uh, there is a very sensitive area and coming away from the patient, lower sensitivity of the, er of the area. The higher the sensitivity is, the more the procedure will be disturbed if there is a failure in spatial ergonomics. The second paradigm to conclude is the procedural ergonomics and it is derived from the chaos theory and that means that you can not uh, improvisate all situations in the OR. You have to be prepared. But more things uh, of this uh, procedure, of this surgical procedure, uh, is along chaotic uh, uh, functions. And that means chaotic systems, if you describe the operative procedure as a chaotic system, if you understand it as a chaotic system, you will draw different consequences because you then, then you understand that chaotic systems can only be uh, can only be influenced by planning and by preparation preoperatively before the procedure starts. And this system, this uh, uh, paradigm uh, shows you the importance, the reason why the, the planning has such a great meaning and why the preparation of the environment, of the surgeon himself and of the team in, 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 in the workflow uh, is very important to get good results. And the third paradigm to conclude is the, er this, the mental ergonomics. All our efforts uh, in science, in neurosurgery, is dealing with the patient and the therapy. But there is one important factor missing in that system, and this factor is the surgeon. The surgeon must also be included in this system and must be studied. So each, it is the neuropsychology of the surgeon. And it means that all procedures in the brain of the patient before happen in the brain of the surgeon. This should be the case usually. So the brain of the surgeon operates, is operating the brain of the patient. So each procedure before happens in the brain. And the brain is the most important surgical instrument, the brain of the surgeon. And the brain, but the brain also still is the most important blind spot actually. It's not regarded by, by most colleagues. They don't regard their own brain and the relation of their own brain with the, their own body. And training therefore means uh, mental training, especially mental training. So in minimal invasive evolution, we have to have a mental evolution and we have to have a technical evolution. Here you see Panetsky again with the robot arm and what he called without endoscope, he calls it exoscope. And nowadays this is a new direction. We don't know if it will be of benefit, but we will see. So we have the minimal invasive techniques, but we have also the electronic neurosurgical techniques chips and so on, neurostimulation, neuromodulation, and we will have the biological neurosurgery with X-cell transplantation. So these are new application fields and we, knew, we need new, new integrated single rack effector systems and we have to learn this by learning the ergonomics with this technique. And I thank you for your attention and if you want to read about all of this, you can read it in this recent published book. The second volume will appear this year. I thank you all for your attention.
Thank you very much, Professor Shubin. Thank you, Professor Klaus. Actually, I, I uh, think your uh, presentation is very informative and uh, the minimal invasive uh, uh, concept is the most important concept in the recent neurosurgical uh, development. I think it means uh, a future. Actually, I also tried the minimal invasive keyhole bypass surgery, mm -hmm. STF, MCF bypass. Mm -hmm. the, okay. the, the, the bone flap is only 1.5 centimeter. Yes. <laughs> it's also but we, we have to take uh, the, 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 that the, the trainees are afraid of this. Yeah. This is what they what they have to to to, uh, to train in the laboratory that they are not afraid to do this kind of surgery and they have yeah, to learn yeah, yeah. the key techniques. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question. I, I excuse me. I have a question for the Dr. Klaus. Klaus yes. ah, hello, Professor Ramare. Well, Dr. Klaus, very nice. Congratulations. Very nice uh, lectures. I have a question. Many people have mistaken the minimal invasive with endoscopic and microsurgery principally in transnasal endoscopic. Okay, it's very important. The, the first time is the philosophy and not the instrument. What is your opinion? Well, of course, uh, it's very important to understand that the size of the approach is not the goal of MIN. Mm. The, the size of the approach is a consequence of the planning preoperatively and taking all the information I, uh, which are available to have a good impression what is the character of the lesion what dangers will I face and how can I compete however it is quite clear that approaches transnasally for example are by nature very small so they become the first mean approaches in history in neurosurgery but this has to be trained. This is very important. It has to be trained. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Professor Romero, for joining in. We are extremely thankful to you. Yes, my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Raja. Uh, thanks, Professor Klaus, for a very nice, uh, 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 important lecture. Uh, I, I wish to ask uh, Professor, uh, you did mention the key are the important for the keyhole, uh, but I believe that uh, the Kiro concept is a more suitable uh, for skull-based extra acceleration, uh, where the keyhole are more superficial than the depth location, for example, in the foramen of Monroe, uh, where the pivoting uh, point are depth and uh, uh, the angle, the working angle ergonomic of movement are limited by depth. Uh, uh, so uh, is that a correct uh, concept uh, where, where, where uh, keyhole surgery are more suitable uh, and more applicable uh, for extra axial scar based uh, surgery. My second question, Professor, regarding the... Can I answer the first question? Can I ask the yeah, first? Yeah, sure. sure answer sure, the Prof. first question. Uh, well, it's very important that you understand the, the, advant, the advance which I did from keyhole to min key concept. Min key is not asking for the whole and the conditions of the approach only. It is asking for the keys and for the key concepts and for the key techniques to fulfill minimal invasive goal. And the, the goal of minimal invasiveness is not an anatomical goal. It is a pathophysiological goal. It's a trauma logical goal to minimize the trauma. The trauma. So we have a lot of techniques which I did not mention also uh, who can fulfill to be minimal invasive and the, the, the main major concept is that the minimal invasive surgeon has to decide which kind of combination of minimal invasive techniques he should use. In many cases the, the, the philosophy is that you need combinations yes to compensate for example disadvantage of another technique and one of these combinations from in my experience the most important was the, was the ultrasound therefore i'm very unhappy that many colleagues underestimate the meaning of ultrasound but 
be aware you have an instrument which is an imaging instrument, a real-time imaging instrument, all the time throughout the operation available, and it is a, it's a, 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 a navigation tool. You can target, you can image, and you can navigate. Yes, so you are never lost. You have your private radiology beside you. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, my second question, Professor, uh, regarding the op optical uh, tracking system with the IGS, I believe that is also a limitation for uh, keyhole surgery or minimal invasive surgery where the uh, electromagnetic uh, 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 technology will be a better uh, proof uh, uh, to, to in this concept. Uh, secondly, uh, regarding the ultrasound, Professor, I wish to, to, uh, to find out from you, do you find it's a difficult uh, uh, in terms of uh, positioning, because nowadays we're going towards uh, uh, retractorless uh, and uh, ultrasound is totally against retractorless because you must always put your operative field on top uh, because they need a water uh, as a medium to get ultrasound across. What's your opinion, Professor? Well, uh, the answer is the most important target for minimal invasive in the future will be ergonomics. So if you need for your, to get your goal, a very expensive, huge machinery that mostly disturbs the procedure, it is not ergonomic. So you have not only decide, will I get the goal I want to get, you have to get it also elegantly and ergonomic smoothly, the workflow should and the surgeon himself should never be disturbed by the technique. Uh, positioning should always do regarding the needs of the brain and not the needs of the machines. And the machines has to be adapted to the surgeon and adapted to the patient. This is my thank, answer. Thank, yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay, can I ask one question, Professor Claus? Yes, of course, Professor. Yeah. Uh, Professor Klaus, that was one of the fantastic lectures we have ever had on this uh, forum, ACNS. You started with uh, uh, craniectomy to uh, min to uh, neurosonography. You stressed the importance how neurosonography will tell us more about the uh, pathology, better than the radiology. You told us about exoscope and all the advances. My, uh, my thing is, you know, Professor Parnaski had visited our center and we all adore him. Uh, but more importantly, you told about stitch trial. And my institute was part of the stitch trial. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, stitch trial looked at only a very small group of patients where the patient has yes. a small, small hematoma and patient is disproportionately sick or yes. a large hematoma and the patient is uh, reasonably well preserved and the, because these are the areas where the treating surgeons they don't know whether to wait or to go in so stitch was not a, a good study to tell us about what hematoma has to be operated and all all of us know that a supratendoral hematoma a large hematoma herniating patient you cannot include in a trial while a thalamic hematoma or brainstem hematoma with intraventricular extension whatever you do patient will die. My question to you, Professor, you told that all means, uh, all every, everything's to start with evacuation hematoma. What is your present day concept? You evacuate all hematomas because, you know, secondary damage can occur with that hematoma. Uh, or you just wait and evacuate hematoma only through min technique if patient demands that. Or how much importance you give to uh, the imaging done immediately after, like blend side, spot side, swirl side. These are the uh, signs which show that hematoma can expand. Your comments, please, Professor. Yes. Thank you for your question. Uh, please notice I dedicated my first volume of this series, Key Techniques in Min, uh, Key Concepts in Min to the victims of the stitch trials. To the victims of the stitch trials. And it is my goal to change this politics. 
this surgical concept. Uh, there will be four volumes, volumes dedicated to the basics, the techniques, and third volume will be pathophysiology, a very forgotten uh, and uh, part of our, of our profession. And the last one will be the cases. The, the fourth volume will be the cases. Next year they will come out. Uh, so the, the stitch, I don't, I never, I never accepted the results of stitch. And the stitch uh, I have provided in the first volume, a six chapter, the last chapter of the first volume, I discuss this, the scientific basics of MIN. And I discuss the concept of ABM and I just discuss the concept of only uh, trial driven uh, signs and many other concepts involved in MIN. It is very important that we start this kind of discussion. Should we be terrorized only by randomized trials or are there also other kind and uh, of knowledge that we, we need to tell our residents? And this is uh, uh, my answer. Um, I, 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 another, the second answer, pathophysiology tells you clearly more than each uh, trial that hematova has to be evacuated because, because the secondary uh, the secondary injuries are really catastrophal once you are familiar for example with endoscopy and you have endoscoped the ventricular system after after ventricular bleeding has been cleared it looks terrible. It really looks terrible. You can get an imagination what bleeding is doing to the brain. And we have the technique. We have the technique not to leave them back in the IQ. We have the technique to evacuate it simply from all the cases I did. And I did nearly every bleeding. Some few exceptions, very few exceptions. If you use the ultrasound, this is important. Without ultrasound, I would not do this. Uh, I evacuate these cases all within one hour. Not more. And the timing, timing is a forgotten uh, constant of our profession. Timing in medicine is extremely important. It's important when you start the bleeding, and how uh, when you start to evacuate the bleeding first day second day third day and it's very important to do it maximal not optimal but maximal because otherwise you have the, the chemical destruction of the tissue and this is what you have to avoid and let me tell you we have the technique we are flying to the mars and to the moon and everywhere and some people for fun fly three days into the space. So why should we not have the same money and the same technique for our patients? Thank yes. you. Thank you for your <laughs> thank you. Thank thank, you. thank you very much. It was indeed very informative lecture. As you said, timing is the key as the pathophysiology is also the key. The type of edema in intracerebral hematomas changes very soon into cytotoxic edema and later on having a secondary irreversible injuries. Thank you very much. That was a very wonderful lecture. Thank you, Professor Marco Romero for joining. And uh, I would like to return the session to Professor Shubin for his concluding remarks. Professor Shubin, are you here? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, Klaus, Professor Klaus. Thank, thank you also. Again. Thank you for your assistance, very kind. Thank okay. you, thank you very much. With that, okay. we'll conclude this session. Yes, Professor Klaus, you were saying something? No, thank you. Right. I'm thanks. very happy that I met you, and I hope next time we will make, meet, meet our, uh, us personally. Definitely in better times when the pandemic is nearly over. If, if, that... when, if we have learned not to be afraid of a small, nice virus. <laughs> you know, right. you know, excuse me, you know, okay. we have 20, uh, we have... Uh, 10 high 25 stars in the in the cosmos <laughs> 10 high 25 stars in the cosmos 
but we have 10 high 33 viruses only in the biosphere of our of our uh, globe well, that so you, have to, you have to think about it what it means yeah thank you, you thank you very much for that very interesting information with that we'll move on to a second session and i would like to invite person narita to say his introduction remarks so you should attack narita thank okay. you okay all right good afternoon Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Narita from National Cancer Center, Japan. Uh, today, I will introduce Dr. Shi Chifuen, a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery, Fushan Hospital uh, from Fudan University, Shanghai, China. Uh, his talk is uh, Molecular Pathology in the Diagnosis and Treatment of Gliomas. So let's start the lecture, Dr. Shi. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Narita, for the introduction. And also, um, thanks for the Dr. Kraus, very excellent lectures. And I am doing uh, a lot of uh, uh, keyhole microsurgery uh, in our department. Uh, right now, almost uh, uh, all the uh, anterior cranial uh, anterior scar based tumor, all the tuberculum cellular tumors, we all use that uh, the keyhole surgery to do this. So. Very, good. Very excellent lectures. Thank you. Very good. Okay. So um, today my topic is, uh, uh, firstly, I want to thank that Professor Shi and the Professor Kato's invitation. Uh, it's a very great honor for me to join these uh, uh, webinars. And uh, my background is the uh, microsurgery, glioma surgery, and the, the molecular pathology diagnosis in gliomas. So today my topic is the molecular pathology in diagnosis and treatment of N out uh, diffuse gliomas. So right now that uh, gliomas still remain the number one in the CNS uh, malignant uh, tumors that about uh, 18% is uh, gliomas. So half of the gliomas is uh, belongs to the glioblast tumors. So uh, today we talk about the molecular pathology. The first uh, issue is that we should know what, uh, where molecular pathology comes from. So thanks to the worldwide uh, genetic or genomic studies like TCGA, that uh, from these studies, we have found a wide range of genetic and uh, cancer related genetic and the genomic alterations, uh, especially in the gliomas, as we know that the GBN is the first uh, cancers that studied by the TCGA. So from all these uh, genetic and uh, genomic studies, we found uh, the, 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 the biologic characteristics of the gliomas progression. And the, there are two biological pathways. One is the primary pathways and the other is the secondary pathways. And uh, during these two pathways, we found uh, several very important uh, molecular biomarkers, just like IDH, ATRX, and uh, EGFR. They play very important roles in the malignant progression of the gliomas. So why, uh, as I uh, am a neurosurgeon, so like many neurosurgeons, that they always ask the same questions. Uh, why do we need to do the molecular diagnosis uh, for gliomas? Uh, is it so important for the diagnosis and the treatment of gliomas? So I just want to raise two examples. Uh, the first example is uh, from the paper of the Hartman. I like this paper very much. So uh, in our um, traditional experience that we know the WHO grade uh, can serve as a very important uh, predictor for glioma patients, like that the grade four tumor patients always live shorter than grade two or grade three. But in his papers, we can see that when we add IDH as a biomarkers, we can see that grade four tumors, if with IDH mut mutant, the paper, the patient can also live longer than patient bearing that the astrocytoma grade two or three that with IDH wire type. So this result suggested that molecular uh, biomarkers is very important to predict the patient survivals. 
So another example I want to raise is one of my patients. It's a very young uh, a female patient uh, suffer from the seizure attacks. So we can see a tumor located in the left frontal lobe. When we resect the tumor, the pathology diagnosis is that anaplastic astrocytoma WHO grade three. Then we do the molecular uh, testing for these patients. And uh, interestingly, we found that this tumor harbor IDH mutation, 1P90QQ deletion, and the MGMT promoter methylation. All these results that refer this tumor may be the oligoglial tumors. And this tumor is a very good tumors. So we treat these patients with only temozolomide. And after, during the past five years, the patient did do the regular check and the no tumor recurrence was found. So these examples showed that molecular uh, diagnosis uh, may be very important for us to, to make uh, treatment plans uh, for individual patients. So in the uh, WHO 2016 uh, edition, we found that several uh, molecular biomarkers has been introduced uh, in the glioma diagnosis like IDH, 1P19Q and the RELA. So this is the diagnosis workflow chart uh, for gliomas uh, that uh, according to the 2016 systems. And after that, we can see uh, the, that when we add the molecular biomarkers that the tumor can be further strat stratified uh, with different clinical outcomes. So we also do this uh, in our own uh, patient cohort. So this result is also very interesting. The same result as Hartman's result that we use um, uh, four biomarkers, IDH, 1P19Q30 and the EGFR. We can separate all the lower grade gliomas into four subgroups. And we can see if uh, the group IDH mutant OT subgroups is the most best survival uh, subgroups. And if patients with grade three IDH mutants OT group, it can be, uh, the patient can live longer than IDH Y type ET subgroups, even that WHO grade is WHO grade two. So this result has also showed that molecular diagnosis can predict glioma patient survival more accurate. And that's one meaning or significance that we should do molecular bi uh, diagnosis for glioma patients. So we also develop our own uh, single genetic biomarker uh, systems to, uh, to stratify that all the gliomas into different molecular subgroups. And uh, why we use single genetic biomarkers because it is more available or feasible for uh, our uh, normal neurosurgical institute lab to do these biomarkers. Uh, and also we use that uh, IDH, TERT, 1P19Q, BROF, EGFR, 10 q and H3. By using these single biomarkers, we can separate all the gliomas into six molecular grades. And we can see if the tumor goes to molecular grade one, uh, that patient can live longer than 30 years is a very good result. But if it goes to grade six, the overall survival time is only one year, very poor clinical outcomes. So uh, when time goes to uh, 2021, uh, as we know that maybe in these years, the new edition of WHO uh, diagnosis uh, will be published. And before that, the, the, the WHO uh, uh, seeing pick now that this is a, 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 a this is a very informal uh, groups, they did a lot of summaries uh, for the upgrade of molecular diagnosis during the past uh, five years that from 2016 to 2021. And in this uh, uh, published uh, papers, we can find the two major changes uh, for glioma uh, diagnosis. That is for the IDH wild type low grade glioma, and that the other is IDH mutant astrocytomas. So first, for the IDH wild type lower grade lower grade gliomas, uh, in the past, uh, in the edition of 2016, we regard this kind of tumor as GBN equivalent because they have similar overall survival times. 
maybe 1.5 years or two years. But in this new update uh, editions, we can find if tumor harbor one of three biomarkers, that is EGR, FR amplifications, uh, that is chromosome 10, 7 gain and the chromosome 10 loss, or third promoter mutation, this kind of tumor can be diagnosed with the integrated diagnosis that diffuse astrocytic gloma, IDH Y type with molecular features of glioblastoma WHO grade four. This is the major change uh, for glioma uh, diagnosis. So we also uh, the, have the same uh, result in our own uh, researchers. And we published this paper that three years uh, ago. And we also use uh, these three biomarkers. And if one of three biomarkers exists, we call this kind of tumor the molecular lower, uh, higher grade tumors. If all three biomarkers lacking, so we call this that molecular lower grade gliomers. And uh, uh, if in the molecular lower grade gliomers, uh, when tumor have the MYB amplification, the, the patient can live uh, much longer. So another uh, major change is about IDH uh, mutant astrocytomas. Uh, in the new editions, we can see there is no more Greek Arabic that two, three, four that it has replaced by the Arabic uh, Arabic grade two, three, fours, and the no more secondary uh, uh, glioblastomas. And the, the most important is the the add of the CDKN two A B homozygous deletion. If tumor grade three have this kind of molecular alteration, it can directly diagnosed as the grade four tumors. So we also have the same result uh, as that seeing pick now uh, indicated uh, in our uh, patient cohort. We also use three biomarkers, PDGFRA, CDKN2A, and CDK4 to separate that IDH mutant astrocytoma into three different risk groups and the high risk patient that they have the, the poor outcomes and the, the low risk patient have the best outcomes. All these findings uh, uh, show that uh, the, the single uh, molecular biomarker based uh, diagnosis scheme is very important uh, for the glioma diagnosis. But uh, we also have uh, two major uh, problems when we use uh, single uh, biomarkers to do the glioma diagnosis. Uh, the first uh, problems is that the, the sampling files, as we know, sometimes our uh, resect sample is very small or the sample quality is very poor. So we cannot have the right uh, uh, molecular diagnosis results. The other is not all the tumors are uh, made current molecular diagnose, diagnosis schemes. Uh, for example, so if a tumor is IDH wire type, but with 1P NITQQ deletion, uh, what kind of tumor it is, we don't know. So in 1917, uh, 18, there has uh, published a, a, a paper by Kepler from the DKFZ. It's a very important paper. Uh, the author that uh, raised a new method, what we call the genome-wide DNA methylation pattern, uh, we call it the methylome. By using the methylome, we can resolve uh, the, uh, the above two uh, problems. One is the, uh, the, the, the materials low qualities, and the other is the tumor heterogeneities. So by using this new method, that all the glioma can be separated into seven or uh, 16 subgroups, and the seven goes to GBM and the nine goes to LGG. So after that, we can exactly know what kind of the tumor is. For example, the same, uh, the, the tumor I mentioned, if a tumor is IDH Y type, but 1P NITQ code deletion, what it is. So this kind of tumor can be performed by the methylome, so we can know where it, uh, it goes to the, uh, the, 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 the different methylation subgroups. So uh, this method is uh, put by DKFC online. So everyone can use these online tools. If we, uh, you can firstly uh, detect a tumor sample by methylation, methylome, then you upload your methylome result to the website. Then you finally got an uh, integrated diagnosis report, like uh, what I said on the right side, 
that if a GBM a tumor go to the methylome, it can be diagnosed as the adult GBM, IDHY type, RTK2 subgroups. So um, right now, more and more uh, researchers has, have used these kind of tools to do some researches. We also use this to do a, a very interesting research. It is about the IDH mutant primary glioblastomas. As we know that in the new edition of WHO 2021, the secondary glioblastoma has been removed. So if it is removed, what is IDH mutant primary glioblastoma? We don't know what it is. So we use methylome to do this kind of researches. So by using the methylome method, we can separate uh, all the IDH mutant primary glioblastoma into uh, six methylation subgroups. And the three goes to GBMs. That is okay, they are GBM, but the three goes to the lower grade gliomers, that is the uh, IDH mutant gliomers. So these three uh, methylation subgroups tumors may have very good results that explained uh, what the exactly the IDH mutant primary glioblastoma is. So by using this, uh, we incorporate our results uh, into uh, seeing PEC now results, and we can work out such a uh, diagnosis flow chart uh, by first step using IDH mutant of Y type. If it is Y type that has one of three biomarkers, it can be diagnosed into molecular glioblastoma. But if it's a mutant, uh, also with uh, CDKN2A and B code deletion, as I, si as I said, it can be directly goes to grade four tumors. But in grade four tumors, there is a clinical primary or clinical secondary. So clinical secondary tumor it is, has an unfavorable prognosis. But if it is clinary, clinical primary tumors, when well, we should do the, uh, the methylome, then can separate it into favorable or unfavorable outcomes. So in the first part that uh, have a brief con conclusion that is the uh, molecular diagnosis combined with the histological diagnosis is very important to predict patient outcome uh, clinical survival. And the single molecular biomarker is available for routine clinical practice right now in many neurosurgical institutes. And for some undefined glioma cases, like I said before, that methylation profiling may be a surrogate for molecular diagnosis. The, the last but the very important, uh, that is for neurosurgeons, we should know and we should understand the basic molecular pathway because it really helps a lot when we treat glioma patients. So in my second part uh, of today's topic, I want to um, talk about the, the molecular pathology, the, relation, the relationship of molecular pathology with, uh, with glioma surgeries. Uh, this is a very, uh, uh, important paper uh, published by the Sané and uh, Berger. And uh, as we know that uh, for glioma surgeries, that maximal resection means that patient can uh, live longer. And uh, in this uh, paper published on the Journal of Neurosurgery 2011, I think that it may be the most cited papers in the neurosurgical field that uh, more uh, that the more EOR means that uh, more survival times. So but right now that we have uh, entered the molecular uh, era of glioma treatment, and this is another very uh, interesting paper that I have read. It's about the relationship of the uh, molecular biomarkers IDH1 um, with the uh, resection extent. That the result of this paper showed if tumor is IDH uh, mutations, when we resect tumor, uh, we should do larger resections extent that according to the uh, MR navigation, that T2 flare navigation. But if this patient is IDH wild type, we just uh, resect the tumor uh, uh, guided by the, uh, T T1 contrast uh, imagers. So uh, if uh, that means that uh, the radical tumor resections do not do benefit to patient survivors. This paper has demonstrated that molecular uh, biomarkers has a very good, in, uh, can be served as a very good indicator for neurosurgeons to decide the extent of resection in glioma surgery. 
So we do, uh, 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 we can see right now more and more papers, they have been focused on the molecular uh, status of tumor, uh, the relationship with it and uh, with the uh, extent of resections. And for astrocytomer uh, IDH mutant, right now we think that if we resect more tumors, it can help patients to live longer. But the, the major uh, problem is that sometimes we only find the image boundary, but we cannot find the biological boundary. If we resect this kind of tumor according to the biological boundary, maybe patient can benefit a lot from this kind of surgeries. And also for oligodendroglioma uh, patient, as we know uh, right now that if patients have the 1P19Q co-deletion, it can be diagnosed as oligodendroglioma's. This kind of tumors, uh, sometimes it's hard to get gross total resection and the gross total resection may not improve uh, the patient's uh, prognosis. So we call that the downs with the tumor. We can uh, live with, tum uh, with tumor res residues and no need to um, resect all the tumors, especially for some insular island gliomas. Uh, if it is the oligodendroglioma tumors, we can uh, leave uh, a part of tumor if it is close uh, to the uh, allocant areas. But for the astrocytoma uh, IDH Y type, uh, there has some contradiction and uh, whether we should resect uh, all the tumors or, or expand, expand the, the, the extent of the tumor resections. No one knows. So uh, here in our department, uh, this is a, a clinical trials conducted by the uh, Professor Wu and uh, they have enrolled 194 uh, uh, IDH wire type uh, low grade glioma in these clinical trials. And they started the EOR uh, with the, the uh, patient clinical uh, outcomes. So from their uh, researchers that we can see for IDH wire type lower grade glioma patients, uh, the, the EOR is closely correlated with patient uh, survivals. And if uh, the EOR is 100%, people, uh, patient can obviously uh, live longer uh, than the patients who has not the tumor totally resections. And uh, uh, another tip is that about this kind of tumor is that for IDH wild type uh, lower grade gliomas, uh, the elevation of EOR, especially when gross total resection of T2 flare uh, image guidance can be achieved it can greatly affect patients' prognosis. Whereas a plaque in the survival benefits uh, existed for some incompletely excised cases. So, um, but for uh, this kind of tumor, we should set up a threshold uh, for the EORs. Uh, from these researchers, uh, we can see only when resection percentage is more than 97%, or the residue tumor volume is less than 4. cubic meters, that kind of resections will do benefit to IDH wild type lower grade gliomas. So we further um, have we have further studied uh, this kind of uh, patients. That's because this kind of patients, according to seeing now trees, if they are IDH wild type if they have third promoter mutation, this kind of tumor can be diagnosed as the GBM, which means this kind of patients did not have a very good prognosis. So we put third into this kind of research to see whether third can guide how much tumor we should resect it. Then the, the data is very interesting. So we can see if the tumor has third mutation, we should resect as much as more tumor as we can. So this kind of patients can benefit from such kind of radical tumor resections. And it will, will help them to have the same uh, survival outcomes as IDH wild type, third wild type tumor patients. 
And this kind of uh, result suggested that uh, uh, that uh, for, for, for our neurosurgeons, uh, if we can know the molecular characteristics of the tumor uh, in, uh, during the operations and use this as a digital uh, guidance that we can help patients to have a better prognosis. So for this part, we have a conclusion that is uh, the molecular information may act as a digital interoperative guidance for our um, glioma surgeries. And for the IDH wild type lower grade gliomas, that extensive surgical resection rate can help patients have longer survival. And the third promoter, wild type and mutant astrocytoma, they could be narrowed when a relatively complete resection is achieved. Uh, if we, uh, that means that we can use the, the surgical method to improve the outcomes. But as I, si as I said, that the new technology should be developed. What kind of new technologies? It can help us uh, before the surgery or intraoperatively that we can know the molecular information. So it can be guided uh, as a guidance for us to decide uh, the extent of the resection we are going to do for the glioma patients. So uh, thanks for uh, my colleagues uh, in my department and thanks for the partnership uh, from the Hong Kong uh, University, Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, today that is what I want to uh, share with all of you today about the molecular pathologies and uh, uh, its roles in the surgery guidance. So thank you all. Uh, thank you for wonderful lecture, Dr. Xi. Um, so you have molecular grading is very unique. Uh, recently, the summary of 21 qualification brain tool was published on Neuro on Journal. So the molecular classification of gliomas, especially pedi pediatric type diffuse glioma, are got more complicated. So how do you diagnose a tumor? Uh, do you usually use DNA methylation array or next generation sequencing uh, for the use of uh, diag diagnosis? Thanks, Dr. Narita. Thanks for your questions. So actually, uh, uh, as I said, uh, I, I do not recommend in the very first step uh, you should use the methylation or the next generation sequencing because it is technically complicated and it is also expensive. So first step, you can use the, uh, what I, sh I, I showed that the single uh, biomarker based systems to do the diagnosis. If it is okay, then you, you no need, there is no need to go further. But if it is difficult to define the tumor by single molecular biomarkers, yet you can try the, the, the methylation uh, method and uh, I think the methylation method is a very good method right now. It can help you help you to know exactly what the tumor is. I have a question for you, Dr. Xi. Uh, congratulations, very nice presentation. Uh, uh, the main problem we have with the glio gliomas is the uh, resection, okay? Many people comment, I have a total resection. We see that the I have a lesion in the MRI, and, and when we have 20 minutes before the, uh, the large the, 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 the area of reinforcement of reforce to have tumors, and it's very difficult uh, resection total is very important. Okay, and the second question is when you have a surgery, mass radio surgery, and chemo, do you have many images in the follow that you, you don't have if? recurrence or uh, change for the radiotherapy of chemotherapy. Do you have any uh, comment in this? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I think I, I, I can uh, answer your questions that to, uh, 
from uh, from one answers. Yes, in my in my department, regularly we we have the intraoperative MRI, but we are not we, we don't regularly use it because it says uh, there is only one uh, intraoperative uh, MRI suit. Uh, so we can use uh, regularly. We use the regular operation rooms. That but uh, we uh, you are right. Sometimes that for the reason of the brain shift that we. Uh, it is hard for us to say uh, if we uh, do the, the, the gross to total tumor resections. Sometimes we just uh, depend on uh, the interoperative MRI guidance or the experience of the neurosurgeons. So uh, the post-operative MRI scan is very important. Right now, uh, here in our department, when we do the glioma surgery resections, that we will do the MRI uh, scan uh, the first day of the uh, within the uh, the first three days of uh, after the operations, then we will use a uh, 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 softwares to uh, calculate how much tumor we resected and how many tumor residues. And I think that this calculation is very important. Uh, right now, we have developed a lot of. Uh, very good um, tools uh, by the artificial intelligence uh, assistance that we can uh, do the tumor segmentation very accurately. Uh, it will greatly help us uh, with the uh, calculation of tumors of volume residue or how much uh, we resected. But if we do the clinical trials, that uh, we, we should use the intraoperative MRI because it is more accurate, but it really uh, needs a lot of time and uh, uh, to do these kind of researches. Thank you very much. Uh, can, can I ask one question, uh, Raja? Yes, please, yes, sir. See, one of the very good lecture, excellent educative lecture. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, how much importance you give for imaging uh, to distinguish between uh, astrocytoma and uh, oligodendroglioma based on location, because now, and also to predict IDH mutation. Because now increasingly more uh, literature has come, which shows that uh, frontal, parietal, or occipital location is mostly for oligodendroglioma. Temporal insular is for astrocytoma. And uh, you told that insular about oligo, which hardly ever occurs in uh, insular region. Usually it is a diffuse astrocytoma. And second thing is, you know, IDH mutant astrocytoma, that is low grade astrocytoma. They show T2 flyer mismatch. T2, they will be hyper intense, but in uh, uh, flyer image, it becomes dark. It is characteristic of IDH mutant uh, uh, astrocytoma, which doesn't occur with oligo. As you correctly told, all oligos are IDH mutant and 1P19Q deletion. They are heterogeneous tumors, more on frontal, parietal, occipital location, irregular margin, heterogeneous enhancement. It can extend to the cortex. It can show you sometimes high perfusion because of chicken wear pattern. And these days we can easily distinguish molecular characteristics based on imaging. And also there is a spectroscopy called 2-hydroxyglutaraldehyde. These are there only for IDH mutant astrocytoma. Your thoughts on this, see. See, you are around. Dr. Shi Chifeng, are you here? We have lost your connection, Dr. Shi. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, then I think we will write to him. No problem. <laughs> no okay. problem. Dr. Oh. Narita is here, of course. He can answer you. Okay. So you can uh -huh. add, yeah, imaging in IDH mutant and yeah. uh, oligo and uh, astrocytoma. So I don't know, yeah. 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 <laughs> A T2 flare mismatch is very important uh, to diagnosis of astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma. However, uh, some cases are wrong. So uh, it is very important to remove the tumor and examine the molecular diagnosis. Mm. Well, but and, the low-grade uh, low astrocytoma, it is characteristic. High-grade astrocytoma, they, it, it won't show. T2 flyer mismatch. Oligos will never show that. Yeah, uh, recently uh, I experienced uh, uh, flyer mismatch cases, uh, no. but uh, it is oligodendroglioma. I'm very surprised to see the result. Uh, mm. 
thank you thank you very much i think because the professor chief yes professor takashi khan uh, yeah uh, i'm uh, dr khan uh, from showa university tokyo japan i'd like to ask you, dr narrator so the oligodendron grammar is a uh, teacher frame is much is that uh, an aplastic or a grade 2 oligodendron grammar hmm? is that uh, uh, oligodendron grammar historically right. uh, an aplastic or no uh, Grade two oligodendroglioma and the T2 frame mismatch case. Usually, uh, usually T2 frame mismatch case uh, is astrocytoma. astrocytoma. In my yeah. experience, uh, oligoden uh, it is uh, oligodendroglioma grade two. Grade two. Oh, okay. Yeah, grade uh, two. It's, it's, uh, uh, Mi one okay. uh, staining index is not so high. And my is not so high. Oh. Uh, not so oh. many. Yeah. Oh, right. thank you. Thank, thank you. Good information. Professor Chifeng is again back with us. Yes, Professor Chifeng. Yes, okay. I'm back. I'm sorry that I maybe lost uh, that several minutes before. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Professor Narita has covered your answers. Thank you very much, Professor Narita. Thanks very much to the Dr. Narita. <laughs> so it was okay. indeed a wonderful presentation. We would like to hear the concluding remarks from Professor Narita. Okay. You may give your concluding remarks, Professor Narita. Okay. Uh, uh, re uh, recently, uh, the classification of goriomas uh, got more implicated. Uh, even in Japan or even in uh, Fuda University, uh, it's very difficult to uh, classify the uh, gly gliomas. So, we have to invent, invent the new method or well, new uh, uh, easy method to uh, classify the gliomas. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the chairs and the presentation, uh, Professor Klaus and uh, Professor Zhifeng. Actually, today we have the, around 1,600 audience in the WeChat channel to attend this webinar. It's quite a remarkable. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is indeed a remarkable feat. Thank you very much, Professor Shubin. With that, I would like to wind this up officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of CEO Kato, I'd like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Klaus Resch and Professor Shi Chi Feng, as well as the chairs, Professor Yushitaka Narita and Professor Shubin. The special thanks to Professor Shubin for helping us out in reaching out a larger audience in his country and giving us access to wonderful surgeons who are also wonderful speakers. So we have a lot of learning from China. So a special thanks to my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Seng, for joining me today. And with that, I'll wind this up. Until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from everybody. Thank you very much for joining.